So Psalm 1 begins with the very best emotion that anybody could have or the very best scenario is the word blessed or blessed. You know, when you're out in life and someone says, uh, be blessed or bless you, there's something about that word, no matter who says it, it just makes you feel good. There's no doubt about it. Uh, God bless you. Whoever came up with that one, people would sneeze. And they say, you're as close to death as you'll ever be when you sneeze because of the pressure suddenly on the heart. And uh, somebody said that's why they say, God bless you, because you made it through it. So, uh, so I hope nobody sneezes tonight and we don't get a chance to tell you that. That's an awful thing, but, but we'll, so we'll tell you ahead of time by faith, God bless you. Anyway, so all that to say, the word blessed, I mean, the very first word in the book of Psalms, blessed. So what a, what a tremendous thing. By definition, you don't really need this, but by definition, the word means happy or fortunate, anything like that. And especially, I think it leans toward not just feeling a certain way, but uh, your, your, your position that you're in is good, it's right, and uh, it's of God that uh, you're in that position. Uh, so it says here, blessed is the man. All right, let's just stop there a minute. So anybody can attain whatever this psalm is going to say, even the first verse. Anybody can do whatever verse 1 is going to say. This is not simply for uh, just an isolated few or, you know, the elite or anybody. This is for anybody. Any person can benefit and be blessed. Uh, so this is the condition that everybody would want. If God says you were blessed of God, uh, a church being blessed of God, that, that's making a very intense statement. So notice the three knots that are found in here. These are very, very important because the person that is blessed is not going to be in the situation that's about to be named throughout the rest of the psalm here. And it's very important. And, and to notice how it's worded too. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So in all three cases, I think that depicts uh, an unsafe position, particularly when it says ungodly. That, that speaks for itself. Ungodly is the person that doesn't recognize God. God's not in his life. So when you look at it, though, you notice here, it didn't just say, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly or the sinner, or the scornful. No, it uses three different positions that a person could be in, and it seems like it's a progression. Really, the word would be digression. When you look at walk, stand, and see it, sounds like to me that when a person begins in a certain, not necessarily literally, but you know, just, just think about literally if we were walking together and we liked the conversation that we had, whatever, the, whatever we were talking about, Eventually, when someone does something like that, it's not just a passing thing. Usually, if someone's in an intense conversation and they're, they're walking, okay, and then uh, they, they, they stop to really, you know, get to the conversation, and then eventually the position, as it says here, is to sit down. Now, you look at that, and I think it is a progression. It's kind of like in life, you ever had someone say something to you, you're kind of saying, you know, I'm in a hurry, but I hear what you're saying, but you don't, you don't take the time either purposely or for whatever reasons. I've seen people that uh, sometimes I was scared of them a little bit, and they'd say something, and I'd be like, you know, I got, I got to be somewhere in my heart. I'm thinking, I'm not going to stop because I don't trust this person. You say, really? Yeah, I was in a position like that. And I think when you look at this, there's a reason why it says the walk and the stand and, and the sitting here. And then you look at the, the, that the description of them. You've got the ungodly. That's a very broad statement. I get that. Then it says the way of the sinner. Again, that's someone that's standing in the way of. The way of indicates where they, where they would kind of uh, congregate, if you please. You remember when uh, the Lord told us about a lot that he sat in the gate of Sodom and Gomorrah? That's where the people that were of uh, influence, uh, the guys that were sitting around, so to speak, it's kind of the old... Uh, remember the old filling stations, you'd pull up somewhere and there'd be guys sitting out front just, just talking and whittling or whatever, just kind of, uh, you know, there together. Uh, it kind of gives the idea that as you're, as you're walking here, you may hear something and you can continue to walk, but you don't stop and really take it in. And then it says the seed of the scornful. And the scorner is the one that when you go to the book of Proverbs, it basically lists, uh, I think it's four main people. You've got uh, 
kind of in reverse order. You've got the simple. That's the one that's, that can be impressed by anybody. It talks about the simple. They go somewhere and uh, the woman catches the simple and it causes him to fall because he's simple. He's really, uh, he's not either or, he's just influenced by everybody. That would typically be someone that's young. Then you've got the, uh, the simple, you've got uh, the fool, okay? The fool is the one that says there is no God absolutely without God. The scorner is basically the same thing, but they're very verbal about it. These are the ones that, uh, that are so wrapped up in opposing God that they're very boisterous about it. The scorner means they're, they're, they're intent on letting everybody know about it. Uh, and the wise person, of course, is the person who would follow God and do the right thing, which would be this person. So when you look at it, you're walking, you're standing, and then eventually you sit down and seat. And the Bible talks about that. That sitting there, I think, is where we, where we would use the word fellowship. That's where you spend a huge volume of time with somebody, a group of people. And by that time, they've greatly influenced you to the point where, and here's the thing about a scorner. Here's how some people are, and I'm not being very uh, uh, transparent about this, but I mean, this is the simple truth. There are people, they'll say something to you to see your response, to see if they can go further with it. Uh, I mean, I don't want to get into any details, cause it, but you know what I'm talking about. I don't need to explain that. And they'll say something, and they'll see if you bite on it, so to speak. Uh, people fishing a little bit, they'll say something, see what you say about it. That way they know your position. The person who sits down with the scorner, that scorner feels very comfortable in dumping everything they've got to say on you because they know you're going to listen to it, and in some cases you're already in a position where you, you receive that. That's not a good position. And again, when you look at the people that's doing this, these would be all ungodly, the sinner, and, and the, scorn, the scornful meaning, all those that are without God. Now God says the person who's in that position, okay, they're not going to be blessed. They're just not going to be. Sadly, there's people, this depicts their life. I mean, I'm so glad that the Bible is, is as relevant as, as, as anything that goes on, and, and this is exactly the scenario. People, and look, this don't have to be necessarily someone's, you know, living. Uh, this is the programming that you watch, okay? Uh, you sit down and you watch people who are scornful. They're ungodly. I don't care what it is. You say, well, these are just... These are fake scenarios. Again, we sit down and, and take in volumes and volumes of things that are, at the very least, vain. What the word vain? Vain is empty. We, 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 we get wrapped up in things that's not even true, and everybody knows they're not true, and yet we put our emotions and we'll discuss them as almost as if they're real. And, and that's, not, that's, not, that's not the blessed person because the person that would do that is really not going to be the one that we would find in verse 2. So I think when you see verse 1, you're going, okay, I get it. Uh, who you hang around with. That's kind of what I said Sunday night. There's no way that if you don't separate from the world and especially people that would be, uh, they're going to influence you and they want to. The things going on in this country, they're designed by design. Look, the people that say some of the things, sometimes we may make the statement, that's just pure stupid. I agree with that. But the people making the statements are not necessarily stupid. They are very crafty. You know, Satan is very, very crafty. He knows what he's doing, and he's the one who goes to the simple. Now, you know, when he went to either Adam or, Adam or Eve, guess what he went to? He went to Eve. The Bible says that Eve was deceived. When Adam sinned, he wasn't deceived. He knew what he was doing. He looked and said, my wife has been deceived, but I'm going to go ahead and partake. And, and it's always been, why did he do that? Why did he say, you know what, honey? God created you, but I know that was wrong, but you were vulnerable because of whatever you want to call it, but you were deceived. I'm not deceived. And Adam wasn't deceived. The Bible speaks about uh, women in general can be deceived. I'm not being uh, whatever you want to call the word. That's what the Bible says about it. And the devil will go to people that are simple. That's why he, he influences the young people easily. That's why these perverts that are in school systems or wherever they're at, uh, they're preying on the more and more younger people. And, uh, you know, God help these people. Matter of fact, I know in the Bible it talks about, you know, it'd be better to have a millstone hung around your neck and you thrown into the ocean than to offend one of the little ones. I know that's probably leaning more toward a spiritual scenario, but I think it also means woe to the person who goes to the very simple and vulnerable and 
and poisons them. So there is a remedy to that. Obviously, you can say, well, I'll just stay away from it. Well, look at verse 2, and this kind of helps us with how we could avoid that because there are crafty people that do that. Programming is designed to do that. But verse 2 says, but his delight, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's the word of God, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. That's his influence. And you may look at it and say, man, that is a, that is a, how does a person do that? Well, if you delight in something, it consumes your time. You know, there's things you can do even though you're doing them. Your mind might be somewhere. It'd be like me uh, working somewhere, and in my mind I'm going, man, I can't wait till I get home and I can get back to that project I have. And your mind is kind of there while you're on something else. I believe you can live through life and have to do certain things, but the Bible says the person who delights in the law of the Lord, the Bible, and he thinks about that, just like when someone would, you would sit down with someone, you've got to think about what is said. All that time and emotion that would go into the man that is walking, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the ungodly man, and of course the sinner who's given all the scenarios. Imagine in, in uh, Lot's day, and the Bible kind of speaks about this, that Lot would sit around with all the people who were wicked, and they would talk about whatever they talked about. And you can imagine the laughter that went on. You can imagine the filthy jokes. Sodom and Gomorrah was, was, was a den of iniquity. No doubt some of those people standing there, they were homosexual because the place was full of that. Matter of fact, when those two angels showed up, you had, you had all aged people in that position trying to get to those angels. And Lot says, you're not, you're not going to mess with these guys. These are guests, and he knew they were angels, and, and literally they about tore the house down. Now, I'm telling you, we're living in a country where it's not going to get prettier, folks. If we don't have people that stand up for righteousness, and especially this, this lack of fulfilling justice, um, I know you may say, well, we're old enough, we're, you know, we, we may not see it. But I woe to the children and the grandchildren that the Lord tarries his coming the danger and the perverseness that's happening right here in America. So what I'm saying is, is that Lot enjoyed that company. And it was interesting that when he tried to tell his sons-in-laws, we need to get out of here. You know what the Bible says? They laughed at him. In fact, they, they, were, they were willing to tell bye-bye to their wives and say, you guys can go ahead if you want to, we're staying here. And they were destroyed. But the point is... Lot sat and listened, and he was vexed day by day using the Bible language with their conversations. He sat, and I probably the first time he sat down, he may have even said this, guys, I don't want to talk about stuff like that. That's, that's filthy, or I don't, that's just not right. And they may have said, well, <laughs> you'll get used to it, which is what happens. There comes a day when you say, that bothered me 10 years ago. Does it bother you now? Sadly, there's things that you said 10 years ago uh, I wouldn't do that, or I won't hang around that, I won't listen to that. And guess what we're doing? We're honest. You know what we're doing? It's vexed us. And even the Lord basically had to just about drag all of them out of there. They, they kind of wanted to stay. And there was old Lot. He, he was a righteous man. The Bible says he was. He was righteous because he, he, he knew the right. But he allowed himself to be influenced by people like this. So his delight wasn't in the law of the Lord, else he could have influenced them. You know what Abraham said? Look, if we can find, beside your family, and I'm kind of reading between the lines there, if, if, if ten could have been, been found in Sodom and Gomorrah, God would have spared it. So you would have figured, okay, let's count Lot and his wife, his two daughters, and the two sons-in-law, if you could count them in that position. So let's just say he needed to find four more people that he himself had influenced and said, you know what? Uh, there's a God and, and all the things that goes with it, but guess what? Lot never influenced not one person, evidently, for God. And that's a sad thing, and he could have, but he didn't. So all that to say, the crowd he hung around with, and he sat there and he digested all of that, and uh, sadly, of course, the whole place was destroyed except for those six. And then, of course, his wife still wanted to be back there, so she turned to a pillar of salt, and his two daughters, sadly, got him up in the mountains and did unspeakable things, and the whole thing was a big mess. And all because Abraham said to Lot, now you go ahead and pick you a place because we are, our herds and everything are so overlapping, we need to kind of, you know, divide a little bit. But I don't think Abraham said just get away. He didn't mean that. But Abra uh, Lot, rather, he pitched his tents towards Sodom. He saw, he knew what it was all about. He was kind of hanging around looking at it. And there's the problem. 
I remember when I was a kid just hanging around, there's something wrong with that, hanging around. You see people kind of, and I know this is kind of extreme, but you see people hanging up, leaning up against a wall like having nothing to do, just watching things and sudden, suddenly people like that suddenly just somehow get in trouble. You know why? They're just kind of waiting for things to happen instead of busy and being in the right place. And I know I've spent a lot of time on that, but the rest of this is just the benefit of the law of the Lord, the Bible. And I say it every, every time, I'm going to say it tonight because this is the center of it. There, there is no substitute for walking with God. We could have church every night here, and we could have Bible say every night, and I believe it would probably be good for us. But I'm going to tell you, there's nothing like you deciding, I'm going to look in the Bible, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to do whatever you want to call it. You can call it cross-referencing. Have you ever read something and just, just instead of just reading it, saying, you know what, I think that sounds like something else I saw somewhere else. And you kind of did a little research, and it's easy to do. I would advise every Christian to get a Strong's Concordance, every last one of you, and take it and just, every word is in the Bible. And you can look up any words. You can look up the word blessed, and you can see every time it's listed, you go, man, that's incredible, and, 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 and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. It, it's, it's more than just a, uh, a short amount of time. He's, he's thinking about it and pondering it. Now notice here, let's see what we have. I'm going to get away from outline here. Number two on that outline there, when the Word of God becomes delightful to you, then you really grow and become stable, which is what we're about to read. An old preacher, J. Vernon McGee, he used to have a radio pro, uh, broadcast. I heard it, I think, when I was a teenager, but uh, it took him five years to get through the entire Bible. He would read portions of Scripture, and he would give a little commentary on it, basically. And uh, but here's what he said. He said, God has no plan or program by which you grow and develop as a believer apart from his word. And I believe that. And I believe there's a reason why there's some Christians struggling because uh, sadly there's leadership that don't push it. I push it, push it, because you know what? This is exactly what I would want for you. and It's what God wants to be blessed. And there's no way a life outside of the word of God is going to do that. There's just no way. There, there's just no way that's going to happen. And, uh, and then look at the other benefits here. This is where you see, see the stability and the faithfulness decade after decade after decade of a child of God. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at that, I go, man, if that's ever a promise I want to hang on to and I want to get a hold of, whatsoever he doeth, shall prosper. That is a promise from God Almighty. You talk about success no matter what field you're in. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're a preacher or you're a plumber or a policeman or whatever you are. The Bible says you would be, you would prosper. And I love this. You're going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now, there's a reason why it's phrased that way. It's not just saying you're going to be like a tree that's strong and powerful. It says there's a tree that's by the rivers of water. And you know what that would mean? That would mean that the tree planted by the river of water is going to be more um, able to withstand the droughts and all the things that would happen because it's already got a water supply that when other things not near a body of water, they're, they're going to suffer. But you take a tree planted by the rivers of water and imagine usually... Uh, uh, a plant will seek, and, 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 and its root system will seek where moisture goes. That's why, and I don't get into this too heavily, but that's why they, when you plant something, you don't want it in a great big container. Because if you water, you put a plant that's this big in a container this big and say, man, he's got plenty of room. Yeah, well, you put water on it, and the water's going to go down here, and it's going to miss that water. Or it's going it's to have to struggle to get to it. That's interesting, the phrasing here, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and notice this, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. That season denotes there's a timing there. It's just like anything, just like this year I planted things. Well, I didn't expect when I put that little seed of corn in the ground that in a week's time I'm going to be you know, taking ears of corn off. I knew that. I knew it was going to be about 80 to 90 days. I knew those watermelons I've got coming up now, they were planted uh, May the 1st or whenever it was. So the point is, there is a season. But there's things that's happening. And notice it mentions not only the fruit, but it says his leaf also shall not wither. That means they're in the process, of, that means that the 
the, the plant, the tree is healthy. It's, 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 not, it's not going to suffer. Even when you don't see the fruit or the fruit's not there yet, there's something about the mechanism or the, uh, uh, the things that's there that's going to yield the fruit one day. It, it's there. And I guess I liken that because God's not trying to make us out like trees. He's trying to say as a child of God, you're going to be a person and when you delight in the law of God, what's going to happen is you're going to grow and you're going to be steady. You're going to be able to, to withstand all the things that would go through life, that you would go through life. And if you've got any age on you just like me, I've, I've got enough age on me. I've seen, I've seen things and I've seen the changes. And yet, show me the steady people. Show me the people that when this came around and this came around, these different doctrines, these different things, these different movements, these different fads. I'm talking about church-wise. You got people, they're, they're not steady at all. And that's a sad thing because the ones that really suffer is going to be the ones closest to them, those children, those grandchildren. And people see that and when the people that should be steady are not steady or they're trying to be like the ones who's the youngest. To me, there's nothing, well, I shouldn't say nothing worse. There's a lot of worse things. But to me, there's nothing quite looks odd. And I mean, I mean this when it becomes almost a lifestyle, when someone who's older wants to be so cool to the young people that they would forfeit all the things that that child needs to see and know just so that kid can think you're cool. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm talking about they, 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 want, they want to be like a kid. Well, look, you're not a kid. You're the grown-up, and that kid needs to see stability and needs to hear the stories of how, you, how you've done what you've done. There's a reason why we've got some of the, the messes we've got, because uh, a bunch of grown-ups want to be a kid again. Well, you're not a kid, and there's things these kids need to see, and they're missing a lot of that. They're missing the things that, that kept you steady. So it's talking about how does a person do this because of the Word of God, and he brings forth his fruit. That means whatever the will of God is for your life, it's going gonna, it's gonna to yield what God wanted it to yield. And, and, and what a great promise, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, anybody would want that. I, I would say to anybody, man, I want to do the will of God. I said, look, there's no way the will of God and you prospering is going, to be, is going to be distant or separate from the word of God. I know people look at it and go, you mean just this book? What's the big deal? And yet you show me the people who's in love with this book. You show me the people that will follow this book and want to hear it. Hey, you show me people that will show up on Sunday night and Wednesday night to hear it, not just show up on Sunday because, well, that's what we do. Let me tell you something. There, there, there's, there's a reason why the lives end up the way they do. There's a reason for that. And uh, I, could, I could say more, and I'm not trying to be nasty about it, but some people wonder, what happened? In my heart as a preacher, if I've been around someone a long time and I say to myself, you want to wonder what happened? And, I, and I'm not sarcastic when people, when they come to me, won't help. But I want to say to myself, well, I'll tell you partly what happened. You quit Wednesday. You quit Sunday night. You, you were not very faithful to the house of God. You were off and on. It got to the point where people, if you weren't here, no one really asked because, well, they're not here all the time anyway. It's just that's the way it is. And then something happens. And then they wonder, well, what happened? I want to say, hey, let me tell you something. God blesses the person. And uh, when you're not around the Word of God, you're typically around something else. So we've got to be careful of that and, uh, so, because we want people to be prosperous. Look, God wants us to prosper more than anybody, and we're His children. He, he's just like you. You look at your child, man, I want my children to, remember the old expression, man, I want my children to have it better than I did. Wouldn't that be great if someone actually thought about that in the spiritual sense? But uh, anyway, so... Because I'm literally preaching to people, you're here and I get that. That doesn't necessarily mean you may not, you may not have a love affair with the Bible, but I'll, I'll give you credit. You're here, you're here in the Bible, and there's a lot of people, they mock this. They think this is dumb. Somebody stands up and all you do is listen to somebody reading out of a book called the Bible. Let me tell you something. When you understand and you've lived long enough, you're going to see the blessings that come with people that stick with the Bible. And these churches, I'm here to tell you, these churches that don't stick with the Bible, they're going, they're, they're, going, they're going to go out of business. Or they're going to be so ineffective that all they are is a social club. That's why as a pastor, I try to keep us from being the social club kind of church. Everybody wants that, and I understand we all want to enjoy each other, but God didn't put us here to be a social club. God put us here to be a church 
we're the ground and pillar of the truth. We're to win souls, and we're to, we, we certainly should be blessed, and the Word of God is, is that. So notice sadly what it says in verse 4, the ungodly are not so. So they're not prosperous. You say, well, they look prosperous. Well, not really. No, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. There's going to be that period where their time is done, what looks like success, and what they've lived for apart from the Bible. Kind of like the man who built his house on the rock, who listened to the Word of God and the one that didn't. There's going to be a great fall one of these days. And sometimes that means certainly the spinning of eternity in hell. But I think it's more, I think it's the life that a person lives. So the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind just driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. Now that's interesting. What, what exactly does that mean? Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. Well, it could be a couple of things. One, standing meaning when they, let's just say when they stand before God. They're, they're standing, in other words, their position is pretty much gone because there's nothing there. The Bible says that people's going to stand before God one day and it's going to be like wood, hay, and stubble. God uses the, the test of fire. God says, we're going to test your works with fire. Wood, hay, and stubble just consumes. There's nothing left. But a person who knows God will endure the fire because you know what? God, God you, you can't consume God. You can't consume the divine. But the ungodly are done. There's nothing that means their works. It also means standing in the judgment, meaning they have a say or a position, if you please, when it comes to determining uh, anything, really. In other words, like a position, if you please. It says, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. In other words, you take two places. Did not David say, it was David who said, or the psalmist did at least. He said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. In other words, be a... Be in the middle, be the big shot, if you please. Kind of, you're part of the crowd. Well, when it comes to the righteous, the sinners, they don't have a position. You know, one day when the Lord returns and there's this 1,000-year reign of Christ, the ones that's going to run this earth is going to be the children of God. They're going to be the end crowd. It's not going to be the crowd that's doing all they're doing today. It's going to be the people that the Lord's going to give positions, and the Bible says He's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. God says, I'm going to rule. Righteousness will prevail. And I'm going to use my people to run this place the way it should have been run. And, uh, and, and the sinner will not have that position. He's not going to be the one that everybody's going, wow, that, he's the popular one. Who's the popular one's going to be? Well, it's going to be Jesus Christ, number one. And righteous people will be the one who's the end crowd, so to speak. Verse 6, for the Lord knoweth, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now, when you think about that statement, yeah, he knows the way, but he knows the way in the sense of the prosperity and the meaningfulness of your life. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. It's, it yields nothing. I know when we all die, we're not taking anything with us. I get that. But let me also say this. Uh, you're, we're to be laying up treasures in heaven. The ungodly person has nothing to lay up in heaven. They won't even trust Jesus as their Savior. There's nothing there. But you know what? We in this life will say, you know what? I'm going to make investments in eternity. And obviously one of the best ways to do that, of course, is, uh, is the winning of souls. When you get to heaven and there's someone there because of your influence, otherwise what else is there? But by the grace of God, we're all going to be there. But I'm saying you're going to want the... Uh, you're going to want the uh, the fact that you know that you live for God and, and there's, going to be, there's going to be things there because of it. We're going to be rewarded one day, folks. I close with this. You know, this day and age, we kind of laugh about this, but you know, these young people, they'll play sports. And I guess this is what they do, but I mean, they say they do, but they give everybody a, a participation uh, medal. And I'm not, I'm not against that part as long as they award the ones who achieve something. You want to give somebody an award uh, for showing up and being on the team? Do it. I think that's great. But if the guy hit the most home runs or he made the least amount of outs or he was at the most practices, uh, then I think you should, re you should award people like that. God says, I'm going to award people. The ungodly are the people who make it sound like, well, we want to be fair. They don't want to be fair. They want to destroy. 
They want to destroy the incentive of those people who will work hard at something. It's just like at work. If you deserve a raise, you ought to get it. But I don't, honestly don't believe everybody ought to get the same raise. Because somebody's going to say, well, if we all get the same raise, then I'm, going out, you know, I'm not going to work as hard as Billy over here because we're going to get the same anyway. God says that there's, there is going to be, be a reward, and uh, we're going to want to get the rewards, whatever they are. Certainly, I know faithfulness is that, and, and there's five crowns the Bible speaks about. So, when I look at this, when we get down to verse number six, there's two outlines to this psalm if you really wanted to outline them. There's two men, there's two ways, and there's two destinies. The ungodly, the godly, the blessed man, the unblessed man. He's got two directions he can go. The way of God, and particularly it mentions the, the law of God, the word of God. And then, of course, there's two destinies. We know eventually it's heaven or hell, but I do believe, of course, it's, it's more than just those places that represent. I think it also means that when you live for God, uh, and sadly, there's going to be some children of God. I think they're going to be disappointed. They should have, they should have done more for the Lord. And then the last one would be practice, power, and permanency of the blessed man. I guess the one thing that kind of stands out amongst all of it is that, that planted, and the leaf won't wither, and they're there. I guess when you think about it, uh, let me just put it this way. I'll use a sports analogy. Sometimes it's, it's a good way to think of something. You take a man that... Spends 20 years in the major leagues, and he has so many hits. Uh, you know what? One of the reasons why he was prosperous is because he spent 20 years doing it. You could take a guy that maybe spent 5 to 10 and maybe has the same amount. That's fine. Uh, maybe he was more gifted or maybe had more opportunity, whatever it is. But tell, I still believe the guy that's, that does something for a long time is just going to be rewarded just because you're just around. It's like, you know, you, you do something long enough and you're going to have results. There's no doubt about it. And uh, so, spiritually speaking, though, it sounds like to me the blessed man certainly is the one who delights in the Word of God. And you know what? That's something that you can do that, that's not affected or determined by anybody else. Uh, just loving God, just loving the Word of God. You know, Enoch was a man who walked with God. And what that means is he loved to be around God. He loved to be in conversation with him. And one day God said, I'm just going to take you right on home, Enoch. But the only description of why he went home was not because uh, he was better than anybody. He walked with God. He said, man, I just, I enjoy walking with you. The old preacher used to say, well, I guess it's time for me to go on home. And the Lord says, you know what, I've just had such a great time with you. Just come on home with me. I don't care how you look at it, when, when God makes a statement like that, it had nothing to do with that Enoch was better or he put in, had greater anything. He just walked with God. And God says, you know what? He must have really loved to walk with God. So let's walk with God. Let's love the Word of God and you get in it. And I'll say this. I wrote it down here, and I am going to be done with this. I think when someone says, and I, and I could see where someone honestly says, well, and here's what people say about the Bible. I read it, and I didn't get anything out of it. Well, number one, that could be a red flag. You didn't get anything out of it. You mean you read it? I could see where someone, because I remember reading the Bible going, I don't understand it, but I know it's good. And I had the hope that God's going to show me, and he did show me a lot of things. But I would say if a person is involved with hanging around the wrong crowd, and you say, well, I, don't, I can't see me just flipping the switch and suddenly going, I just love the law of God. And, and all that right there would go away. It don't usually work that way. The way it usually works is you hear something like this and go, you know what? I'm going to figure out how to delight in the law of God. I know it's right. I know me, myself, you could say is, uh, I know I've been tainted by things, but the more I do it, the more I'm going to like it. It's like the guy one day, he said, that he says, I hate broccoli. Hate it. He says, I detest it. Don't want it. He says, uh, you give me a steak. Don't give me that broccoli. I hate it. And someone says, man, if you, if you tried, you'd like it. And you know what? He started eating a little bit. And he started eating a little bit. And he started eating. Before you know it, he loved it. He absolutely loved it. And, uh, and they, uh, they came to the man one day and says, you know what? Let me show you this. They put a big bowl of broccoli down and a beautiful T-bone steak and said, 
go ahead and choose which one you want. You know what he did? He ate both of them. Yeah, yeah, he ate both of them. He wasn't no dummy. <laughs> anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. He said a little bit deceitful there. Well, uh, I know this. Uh, there's been a lot of things I didn't get. It's like soul winning. You say, well, I don't do it because I don't understand, don't like it. I tell you what, if you do it because God said do it, here's what's going to happen. You're going to love it just like broccoli. It'd be much better for you. But anyway, so there you go. We're going to pray, and then choir, if you'll come up, we'll go through our song, and uh, appreciate you coming out tonight. Lord.